Monsieur le Président. President, President and Office of the Council, Honourable Members, good morning. Sometimes history moves discreetly with careful steps. When we're talking about the work of a commission, which only has a five-year period to make some substantial change, over such a short period of time, you can't bring about a sea change in the state of affairs. The current commission, like its predecessors, is an episode, a, a brief moment in time in the long history of the European Union. Our time has not yet come in our Commission, so I'm not yet going to take stock before you of everything we've done over the last four years. On the contrary, I will tell you that work will continue over the coming months to ensure that our imperfect European Union becomes a little more perfect every day. We still have things to do, which is what I wish to discuss with you this morning. No um, no satisfaction, modesty, turning smile results. That's the approach of our commission as we look at our agenda over the coming months. Sometimes history, in the true sense of the word, thrusts itself into the life of nations without any prior warning. That's what happened at the time of World War I. In 1914, it caught the, the continent off guard. It, it was a, a sunny, calm, optimistic uh, year in 1913. In 1913, Europeans were expecting to live through a lasting peace. And yet, a fratricidal war descended on Europe the next year. I'm referring to that period not just because, or rather not because I'm uh, suggesting that we're on the verge of a similar catastrophe in Europe. The European Union is a guarantee of peace. Let's be happy that we live on a continent of peace a continent which enjoys peace thanks to the European Union. And so let us show more respect to the European Union. Let us not sully its image. Let us defend our way of life, our way of being. Let's embrace a type of patriotism that's not directed towards against others and let us decry knee-jerk nationalism which attacks others and seeks scapegoats rather than looking for solutions which will allow us to coexist better. Le pacte fondateur de européenne. The founding principle of uh, the, the Union, no more, war, never again, this informs our lives and those of everyone around us. What is the state of the Union today, in 2018? Europe has very much uh, got past the economic and financial crisis, which hit us coming from elsewhere and had a very brutal impact on us. Europe, as uh, as uh, said by the Lehman Brothers. We've had nearly 12 million jobs created since 2014. The economy is growing. That's more than the number of people living in Belgium. Never have we had so many people, 239 million men and women, at work in Europe. Youth unemployment stands at 14.8%. That figure is still too high but it's the lowest level since 2000. 
investment has come back to Europe. Thanks in particular to uh, the European Fund for Strategic Investment, which some fewer and fewer are calling the Juncker Plan. That has generated 235 billion worth of public and private investment, and we're on target for 400 billion's worth. And then in Greece, after years which, it must be said, were painful years following unprecedented social problems, Greece has made a success of its program and is back on its feet. I pay homage once again to the Herculean efforts of the Greek people, an effort that others in Europe have still not uh, acknowledged sufficiently. I have always, as you know, defended Greece, its dignity, and its role in Europe, and in particular, its continued membership of the Eurozone, and I'm still proud of that. Europe has also reasserted its trade position. It's a global trade power. This is proof, if ever there was, of the need to pull sovereignty. The European Union today has trade agreements with 70 countries. Taken together, we account for 40% of world GDP. The trade agreements I'm talking about have very often been called into question wrongly. They enable us to export high European food safety standards around the world, as well as workers' rights, environmental standards, and uh, consumer law standards. When last July, during a dangerous period of international tension, I visited both Beijing and Tokyo as well as Washington in one week, I was able to speak in my capacity as President of the Commission on behalf of the largest single market in the world, on behalf of a union which accounts for a fifth of the total world economy, a union which is prepared to defend its values and its interests. I represented Europe as an open continent, but not one that we will hand over. I was able to to set out our, our position in detail and in principle, and I was able to achieve palpable results for our citizens and our firms. When we are united, we Europeans, as a union, have become a, a force to be reckoned with that you cannot do without. Some in Europe were happy with the uh, agreement I reached with uh, uh, President Trump. Some were surprised by it, but that there shouldn't have been a surprise. Whenever Europe speaks as one, we can impose our position on others. Where necessary, Europe must act as one. We demonstrated this with our ceaseless efforts to defend the Paris Climate Agreement. We, as Europeans, want to leave a cleaner planet to coming generations. I agree with our Energy Commissioner's analysis of the CO2 emission uh, uh, cuts for 2030. They're scientifically right and politically necessary. The terrible events of this summer have brought home, not just to farmers, the importance of our efforts to safeguard the future for coming generations. Now, of course, you may choose to ignore the climate challenge and look the other way. We in the Commission and you in Parliament must look towards the future. Ladies and gentlemen, 
the clock is still ticking. The world is ever more volatile. The challenges before our continent are growing day after day. And so we cannot ease up in our efforts, even for one second, as we seek to build a more united and stronger Europe. Europe can export its stability, as we did with our successive enlargements. As far as I'm concerned, those enlargements have been and remain success stories because we've managed to bring together European geography and history. But efforts still remain to be made. We need a, a forthright definition of our attitude towards the accession of Western Balkan countries. Otherwise, others will take it upon themselves to shape our immediate neighbourhood. Let us look around us and see what's happening at this time in Syria, in Idlib. The course of events should be a source of great immediate concern to us all. We cannot remain silent in the face of an impending humanitarian disaster, which is a, a disaster foretold. The Syrian conflict shows us how the international order, which Europeans have taken advantage of since World War II, has increasingly been called into question. Furthermore, in today's world, Europe can no longer rest assured that the commitments entered into in the past will still be respected in the future. Yesterday's alliances may no longer be tomorrow's alliances. As I was saying, today's world needs a strong, united Europe. A Europe working for peace, trade agreements, stable monetary arrangements, even if others elsewhere are all too inclined to resort to uh, commercial or monetary warfare. I don't like that mechanism which uh, acts with no regard for others' interests. I remain a convinced multilateralist. If Europe better realises its political power, its economic power, and sometimes it's the military power of it, its competitive nations, we will no longer have to be uh, the global payer alone, although we, we are still willing to pay. But we have to be global players too. C'est la raison pour laquelle, en dépit d'une forte résistance. That's why, despite strong resistance at the time, as of 2014, I relaunched the European Defence Union. That's why, in the coming months, the Commission will continue its work on the European Defence Fund and permanent structured cooperation in defence to make them fully operational. I should add a point of detail which I think is rather important in this context. We will not be militarising the European Union. What we're seeking is great responsibility and independence because only a strong, united Europe will be in a position to defend our citizens from internal and external threats, be it terrorism or climate change. Only a strong, united Europe can save jobs in an open, interconnected world. Only a strong, united Europe will make it possible for us to rise to the challenge of global digitalization. We Europeans, because we are the largest market in the world, will be able to set standards, uh, data, 
climate uh, standards while upholding our citizens' conditions of, of life, provided we are united. A strong, united Europe will allow its member states to reach for the stars. Thanks to our Galileo program, Europe is still in the space race. No single member state would have been able to launch the satellites that 400 million users around the world are already benefiting from. No member state could have done it on its own. Galileo is a success story. Primarily a European success story. Without Europe, there would be no Galileo. Let's be proud of that. President, geopolitics tells us that the uh, value sounding for Europe's sovereignty, Europe has to embrace its destiny. Europe has a capacity to influence world affairs. Europe must increasingly be a sovereign player in international relations. La sovereignty European. European sovereignty derives from the national sovereignty of our member states. It does not replace what properly lies within the national purview. By pooling sovereignty where necessary, we strengthen all our component nations and regions. That's part and parcel of belonging to the European Union. European sovereignty will never be directed against others. Europe must remain a tolerant, open continent and will remain so. Europe will never become a fortress turning its back on the world in particular the suffering part of the world. Europe must and will remain a multilateral continent because the world belongs to everyone, not just the few. And that's what's at stake in the European elections in May 2019. In the 250 days between now and then, we must get across to our citizens the evidence that when we act together, the European Union can achieve results, and it respects the commitments we entered into at the beginning of our period of office. Between now and the European elections, we must show that Europe is able to overcome differences between the North and the South, the East and the West, the European Union, Europe is too small to split itself into two today and four tomorrow. We have to show clearly that together, East, West, South and North, we're able to plant the seeds of a more sovereign Europe. President, distinguished members, in May, 2019, there will be elections. The citizens of Europe won't be interested in what the Commission is proposing, but it will interest them that that uh, companies um, pay their taxes where they make their profits. Do you avail of volunteers? Voters want a lot from you, not all of you, uh, I know. The voters w want to, to know, know that uh, the Commission proposal will uh, rapidly become a reality. Those who want that are right. If Europeans in 2019, if they want, they won't be... Uh, uh, they will be interested in, in, in what the Commission does on plastics. If the Europeans, if we want to convince them, we want, need a European law which uh, cements the ban on plastics. 
we all declare uh, in fine speeches that we want to be more ambitious in big issue, issues and uh, less ambitious in smaller things. In 20, May 2019, the Europeans won't applaud if uh, twice a year uh, we, ha we have to continue to change the clocks tw um, twice a year. Uh, we need to change this business of changing the clocks. The member states, uh, based on uh, subsidiarity, uh, should decide whether their citizens should live in summer or winter time. We expect that uh, Council and Parliament say this in the same way and will make sure that regional uh, single market uh, conform solutions will be found. Uh, time is pressing. In the months ahead, we should work closer together. So what we promised in 2014 uh, can be delivered in good time before the European elections. When we started, we all promised to deliver an innovative digital single market, uh, a better uh, a monetary union, a banking union, a fair single market, an energy policy, a, a comprehensive migration policy, a union of safety and security, at least most of us uh, undertook that the social dimension of Europe uh, sh shouldn't uh, be in sec second place. It should, should uh, be treated more seriously. The Commission, the, all the initiatives that we uh, announced in the Commission uh, in 2014 were put on the table. Half of them were already uh, adopted by Council and Parliament. 20% are well advanced and 30 percent uh, are stuck in some difficult negotiations. I don't accept that the Commission is responsible for all the uh, faults itself. Of course, there have been shortcomings. Our proposals are well known, in particular when it comes to refugees and migration. They should be uh, adopted and implemented. I won't allow in future I know uh, this will happen, that the Commission uh, is made the uh, sole scapegoat. Scapegoats exist in all institutions, at least of them uh, in the Commission and the Parliament. Uh, leadership on a broad front is needed. This goes to changing our security union. The Europeans expect, quite rightly, that the European Union protects them. So the Commission is proposing new rules today to uh, counter uh, terrorist p propaganda and to take it down from the Internet within an hour. One hour is the decisive time window uh, when the greatest damage can take place. We're also proposing that the tasks of the new European uh, public prosecutor to, uh, uh, will be extended when it comes to fighting terrorist acts. Uh, we must be able to uh, prosecute terrorists across borders. Terrorists don't know any borders. We shouldn't, uh, by not cooperating, we shouldn't make us our, their uh, accomplices. So we're proposing new measures today so that we effectively and we can uh, act on um, money laundering in a cross-border manner. We must be equally decisive to make sure there are free and fair elections in Europe. The Commission is proposing new uh, rules uh, to protect electoral processes against map manipulation by third countries uh, and huge um, uh, private interests. Leadership, uh, seeking compromises, are uh, urgently needed in migration issues. We've made progress, more than uh, is claimed. Five out of the seven Commission proposals 
to uh, reshape our uh, migration system were uh, adopted. Our efforts have been successful. There are 97 uh, percent less uh, mi migrants less in the eastern uh, Mediterranean and 80 percent less in, in the central Mediterranean route. Since 2015, um, over 690,000 people have been saved. But the member states haven't yet the right proportion between um, responsibility for their own sovereignty and the, the necessary solidarity amongst themselves. This solidarity must be provided by the member states if they want to retain the, the Schengen area without internal borders. I am and remain against internal borders. Where they uh, now exist, they must be removed, because if they remain, they should there will be an unacceptable uh, back, backward step uh, in Europe. The Commission and many uh, Council presidencies have made numerous proposals on migration. I call on the Austrian Council Presidency, and they will do this, to make decisive steps so that uh, we have proper solutions for a balanced reform of migration. We can't, when every new sh ship, we can't be talking every time about ad hoc solutions for the people on board. Ad hoc solutions are not adequate. We need a lot more. We need more solidarity, and solidarity must be lasting and it must be organized. We also need more solidarity because we need more efficiency. This also applies when it comes to uh, uh, comes to disaster protection if there are fires somewhere, there are fires everywhere in Europe. Uh, uh, this summer we didn't just have the, the fires, which were uh, pictures we saw, but uh, the uh, Polish uh, uh, firefighters who helped out in Sweden. back to migration. We're putting forward a proposal t today to strengthen the uh, European border and uh, coast guard. External borders must be protected more effectively, so we're proposing that the number of uh, uh, border agencies from the uh, finance from the European budget by 2020 will be uh, 10,000. We're making a a proposal to extend the European uh, Refugee Agency. They need um, support uh, when it comes to processing asylum uh, applications in, in line with the Geneva Convention. We're making a proposal for the return of uh, illegal uh, uh, migrants. I, I repeat my wish in Parliament, which is a, a, a call to open legal uh, routes for migration into Europe. We need qualified migrants. The Commission proposals on this have been on the table for some time, so please uh, implement them. Uh, President, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to talk about the future as well. And we therefore must speak of Africa, Europe's twin continent. By 2050, Africa's population will number 2.5 billion. One in four people on Earth will be African. We need to invest more in our relationship with the nations of this great and noble continent. And we have to stop seeing 
the Africa-EU relationship through the sole prism of development aid. Such an approach uh, is uh, inadequate uh, uh, and is humiliating for Africa. Africa does not need charity. It needs a true and balanced partnership. And Europe needs this partnership just as much. In preparing my speech today, I spoke with my African friends, notably Paul Kagame, the chairperson of the African Union, and we agreed that donor-recipient relations are a thing of the past, and we agreed that reciprocal commitments are the way forward. We want to build a new partnership with Africa. La Commission propose aujourd'hui. Today, we are proposing a new alliance between Europe and Africa, an alliance for investment and sustainable jobs. This alliance, as we see it, would help create up to 10 million jobs in Africa over the next five years. And we want to create a framework that brings more investment to Africa. And we are not starting from scratch. Our external investment uh, plan, which was launched two years ago, will mobilize over 44 billion euro in both the public and private uh, sectors. Uh, the uh, projects which are in the pipeline uh, will be to the tune of 24 billion euro. We want to focus our investment where uh, our uh, actions make a real difference. By 2020, the EU will have supported 35,000 African students and researchers um, through the Erasmus programme. By 2027, this uh, figure should reach 105,000. Trade between Africa and Europe uh, is important. Uh, uh, is significant. 36% of Africa's trade is with the European Union, but trade uh, between us is not enough. I'm convinced that we also have to make progress on uh, other uh, agreements and have a continent-to-continent -continent economic uh, partnership between equal partners uh, and move towards a free trade agreement. Another issue where I see a strong need for the Union for leadership is Brexit. I will not enter into the details of the negotiations, which are being masterfully ended by my friend Michel Barnier. He works on the basis of a unanimous position confirmed time and again by the 27 member states. However, allow me to recall three principles which should guide our work on Brexit in the months uh, to come. First of all, we respect, of course, the British decision to leave our union. Yeah. But we regret it deeply, as you are. But we also ask the British government to understand that someone who leaves the union cannot be in the same privileged position as a member state as a member state if you leave the union you are of course no longer part of our single market and certainly not only in parts of it <clears throat> secondly the european commission this parliament and all other member states will always show loyalty and solidarity with Ireland when it comes to the Irish border. This is why we want to find a creative solution that prevents a hard border in Northern Ireland. <clears throat> and we will defend all the elements of the Good Friday Agreement. It is Brexit that we're making the border 
more visible in Northern Ireland. It's not the European Union. Thirdly, after the 29th of March 2019, the United Kingdom will never be an ordinary third country for us. The United Kingdom will always be a very close neighbour and partner in political, economic and security terms. In the past months, when we needed unity in the Union, Britain was at our side, driven by the same values and principles of all other Europeans. This is why I welcome Prime, Minister's, Prime Minister May's proposal to develop an ambitious new partnership for the future after Brexit. We agree with the statement made in Czechos that the starting point for such a partnership should be a free trade area between the United Kingdom and the European Union. On the basis of these principles, the Commission's negotiators, mainly my good friend Michel Barnier, stand ready to work day and night to reach a deal. We owe it to our citizens and our businesses to ensure the United Kingdom's withdrawal is orderly and that there is stability afterwards. It will not be the Commission that will stand in the way of this. Mesdames et Messieurs uh, les députés. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members, between now and the European elections, and between now and the uh, summit that will take place on the 9th of May uh, of next year in Romania, a lot of work uh, remains to be done. And we'll have to convince our citizens uh, that uh, we share uh, the same purpose of our European Union. In Sibia, uh, we need to make sure that we get things right. People uh, want certainty. Uh, they expect uh, a clear uh, message and don't want uh, uh, half measures to be taken. So let's uh, not give them those then. Uh, and uh, uh, this is all part uh, of the European agenda en route to Sibiu. In Sibiu, we'll have to ratify the partnership agreement between the EU and uh, Japan. And we'll have to enter into that agreement for economic reasons, but also for geopolitical meetings. Between now and Sibiu, we'll have to organize uh, an agreement uh, on principle uh, for the post-2020 EU budget. And we need to give young Europeans an opportunity to make the most of what the Erasmus programme has to offer. And uh, we need to make sure that enough uh, money I is available for it. And we'll have to decide on that matter, as we will uh, have to decide on others, other matters. And if we want to give our researchers and startups more opportunities, and prevent funding gaps costing jobs, we will have to decide on the budget before the elections. Now, without militarising the European Union, if we want to increase defence spending by a factor of 20, again, we will have to decide on this before the elections. If we want to increase our investment in Africa by 23%, again, we must decide quickly uh, he heads of state, uh, ministers, uh, uh, MEPs, uh, uh, national members of parliament. We always hear that we can't decide on these matters before the elections because that would lead to a democratic crisis. Uh, I say no. It's normal in a dem democracy uh, to have elections and it's also normal to uh, take certain decisions before those uh, elections. By uh, next year, we will also have to develop uh, the international role of the euro, uh, which has now uh, existed for 20 years. Uh, and this, uh, 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 in spite uh, of the criticism that has been levelled at it, the euro 
uh, has been uh, successful. It's the second global currency after the dollar. Uh, 60 countries uh, in one way or another have pegged their currency to the euro. But we need to do more to make sure that our single currency can uh, play its full role on the international scene. And recent developments have highlighted the need to uh, uh, deepen uh, uh, our monetary uh, union and the Commission uh, has a lot of proposals that uh, it wants to uh, adopt. We must and will go uh, further. Uh, it's an aberration to have three billion uh, dollars worth uh, of energy imports a year, that's 80%, uh, when only a small part of that comes from the uh, it comes from the United States, and it's an aberration to see that uh, European companies are buying European planes in dollars and not in euro, and that's something we will have to change as well. La raison pour laquelle... uh, this is why the Commission, before the end of the year, will present initi initiatives to strengthen the international role of the euro. The euro must become the uh, active instrument of a new and more sovereign Europe. Uh, we must, of course, first put our own house in order by strengthening our economic and monetary union, uh, which is what we have already started to do. Uh, without a strengthened uh, economic and monetary union, uh, we won't be able uh, to achieve this. We have to complete our economic and monetary union so that the euro can become stronger. And uh, uh, still on the road to uh, Sibio, uh, I would like to make a tangible progress when it comes to strengthening our foreign policy. We need to improve our ability to speak with one voice when it comes to foreign po policy. It is not right that our union uh, silenced itself at the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, when it came to condemning human rights abuses by China, and this because one member state uh, uh, opposed it. Uh, that is just one amongst many examples I could give you. C'est la raison pour laquelle aujourd'hui. And that's the reason why the Commission, again, would uh, propose to you that uh, qualified majority voting uh, is used uh, on matters of foreign policy. Je répète un message. I would repeat the message uh, that I uh, set out in detail last year, and we will be putting forward a number of proposals so that in certain areas, not a all areas are of foreign policy, we can move towards qualified majority voting. Uh, the uh, treaty as it stands allows the EU to take a decision on this basis, and uh, I think the time has now come to use this uh, lost treasure of the Lisbon Treaty, and I think we should be able to decide on certain uh, matters by a qualified majority. And I also think that in relation to certain tax matters, we should be able to decide by a qualified majority. Un mot, Monsieur le Président, pour dire que d'autres façons. Mr. President, we have disagreements between uh, governments and between institutions. 
Increasingly, uh, there are disagreements. Heated exchanges amongst governments and institutions are becoming more and more common. Uh, but the tone is not only worrying when it comes to political discourse. But it is also true of the way uh, some seek to shut down debate altogether by targeting media and journalists. Europe must always be a place where freedom of press uh, is possible uh, and is not called into question. Too many of our journalists are intimidated, attacked or even murdered. Il n'y a pas de democracy. We cannot have democracy without free press. Merci d'applaudir, comme ça je peux boire. Thank you for your applause, that gives me an opportunity to drink. En général, <laughs> try again. Dun Oui, oui. D'une façon générale. Uh, in general, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, must revive the lost art of compromise. Uh, compromise does not mean uh, a weakness or a sacrificing of our uh, convictions. And the Commission will resist any attack on the rule of law, and we continue to be very concerned uh, by the developments in some of our member states. Article 7 must be applied whenever the rule of law is threatened. First Vice President Timmermans is doing a, a remarkable job of defending the rule of law, but all too often he stands alone in defending the rule of law. And the whole Commission, and I personally, support him fully. Et puis, il y a un point and then there is one point on which we have to be very clear that, uh, that is the judgments from the Court of Justice which must be respected and implemented the European Union is a community of law and respecting the rule of law and abiding by court decisions are not an option, but an obligation. Mr. President, honorable members of the European Parliament, friends, uh, I started this speech, it won't be my last speech, but it's my last State of the Union address by talking about history, uh, history uh, uh, which in a small way covers our mandate uh, and of course in a wider sense, uh, 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 covers our time here. And we are all responsible for the Europe of today, and we must all take responsibility for the Europe of tomorrow. Uh, such is history. Parliaments and commissions come and go. Uh, Europe is here to stay. But for Europe to become what it must, uh, there are several lessons to be learned. Uh, Europe can no longer be a spectator or a mere commentator of international events. Europe must be an active player and must become an architect of tomorrow's world. There is a, a strong demand for Europe throughout the world, and to meet such high demand, Europe will have to speak with one voice on the world stage. And uh, amongst nations, Europe's voice must uh, be heard clearly. Uh, Federica Mogherini uh, has made Europe's diplomacy uh, more coherent. Uh, it's more coherent than it's 
ever be. But let us not slide back into the incoherence of competing and parallel national diplomacies. Europe's diplomacy must be conducted in the singular. And from now on in, I would like us to make more efforts to bring together the East and West of Europe. It is time we put an end to the sorry uh, spectacle of a divided Europe. Our continent and those who brought an end to the Cold War deserve better. I would like the European Union to take better care of its social dimension too. Those who ignore the legitimate concerns of workers and small businesses uh, are uh, putting our society at risk and it is time that we proclaimed the Gothenburg Social Summit into law. I would like for next year's elections to be a landmark for European democracy I would like to see the Spitzenkandidaten process uh, repeated, uh, which is a small step forward for European democracy. For me, this process will be made uh, more credible once we have transnational lists, and uh, I hope that that will be in place for the elections in 2024. But above all, I would like us to say no to unhealthy nationalism and to say yes to enlightened patriotism. We should never forget that the patriotism of the 21st century is twofold, both European and national, and they are not mutually exclusive. As the French philosopher Blaise Pascal said, I like things that go together. In order to stand on its own two feet, Europe and its nations must move forward as one. To love Europe is to love its nations. To love your nation is to love Europe. Patriotism is a virtue. Unchecked nationalism is both riddled with poison and deceit. In short, we must remain true to ourselves. The trees we plant today must provide shade for our great-grandchildren, whether they come from the east or the west, the south or the north, to give them all they need to grow and uh, uh, breathe easily. A few years ago, standing in this very same spot, I told you that Europe was the love of my life. I love Europe still and sh shall do so forever. Thank you for your attention. Grazie, signor.